Yeah, I was a kid. This is back in the 70s. I was watching Speed Racer and Battle of the Planets. And a little later, it was Robotech and then Transformers. And I just developed this affinity for this particular style of animation, which was different than Disney or Warner Brothers. And it wasn't the typical Tom and Jerry or Bugs Bunny. And I always gravitated to this as a child. And then in my adult life, you know, I started a video game company importing Japanese video games. And a lot of these video games were in Japanese. And I was doing a mail order business. And it was this grew into from a bedroom business into a multi-million dollar business just doing importing Japanese video games and game consoles from Japan. I thought, well, if people are going to buy these games in Japanese, what if I bought the movies that these games are based on, this, these Japanese cartoons that movies are based upon, and I actually tried English subtitles for them. And then, lo and behold, I you know, contacted a bunch of Japanese companies, and uh, one company came back and was like, you want to buy this? You know, there's no market for this in the States. I'm like, well, let me try, okay? So, you know, we go back and forth with, uh, you know, this particular licensor or supplier of content, and, um, you know, it turns out when we make a deal, I get the rights to this show, and uh, 90 days later, it's released into the market. We sold uh, you know, several thousand copies, and people were like, I can't believe this. You know, the, the tape replicator at the time was like laughing. They were saying, um, you know, this guy's going to go out of business. Yeah. <laughs> what does no, get your money up front? You, you, yeah. You're going to get this guy to pay up front because, you know, who's going to watch Japanese cartoons subtitled in English? Yeah, this, this guy's going to go out of business after this. So get the money up front. So but they were surprised. We went back and needed a second run. They're like, oh, my goodness. And then I bought a second title. Um, then that sold and recouped and made its money back. And I bought a third title, which was called Battle Angel, which James Cameron just did a Battle Angel Alita movie. Oh, cool. <laughs> A few months back or a year or so ago. And um, that IP, Blockbuster's order alone put it into profit before I even released it. I'm like, I'm onto something here. And so I kind of took all my game company business and slowly wound that down and put all the money into my animation business and started licensing and producing more and more Japanese animation. So year one, we had one title. Year two, we had three. Year three, we had 12. And I, uh, my, my business plan was double it every year. So by 2002, uh, there was a, ma it was in Video Business Magazine. We were rated the third largest studio in North America, not in copy depth, but in skew count. So we were up there with Sony and Disney. In terms of sales. And, and ter not in, ter in terms of dollars, but in terms of skew, SKU count, not counting units. So a pro product, product codes, numbers. Product yeah. numbers, that's yeah. correct, yes. The number of items. Sold. Yes, we were doing 80 to 120 per month of different Japanese anime programs. And that's up there with the big boys. And we're this little company, you know, the best little anime house in Texas. So <laughs> Hollywood's like, well, it's amazing. What are you doing down in Texas? Why don't you go out here to L.A.? I'm like, I like it in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> are you a local Houston guy? Yes, I am. I was born and raised here, although I've lived in different parts of the world. I've been all over the world. But I'm, I'm a native Houstonian. Happy to be here. So, okay, so now you're going through all of this. And um, before you sell, okay, so big news about a year ago. Yes. You are now owned by? AMC Networks, the creators and distributors of The Walking Dead, Breaking Bad, and other wonderful shows like Mayfair Witches and Interview with a Vampire. So prior to that, because yes. I know they don't want to, uh, I got your note, we don't want to go into stuff post AMC, but can you tell me before that, give me a sense of the size of Sente. You know, like how many SKU numbers were you selling? Oh, okay. I mean, typically, we were on a we, our business model is a bit different than some of our competitors. One of our competitors, or our biggest competitor, is just like buy everything, regardless of what it is. Um, we are very picky eaters. We like to like look for something that is the underdog title. So we were very, very careful in our selection and curating our content library of titles we thought they, it doesn't really fit their profile, even though it's by everything. The Japanese are very kind and like to keep a balance of power. They don't want one company to have control of any given, any given market, which was what was happening. Um, so they said, you know, they're, and they've known me for 30 years plus, so they, they know, have a there's a relationship business here. So we want to keep John in business and, you know, we want to keep the, your company going. And so, you know, we would be offered different things to keep us, you know, going uh, as a strong going concern business. And, um, you know, so we looked at titles that were art house. We looked at underdog titles. We looked at titles that we could focus on because there was a, uh, a certain LGBTQ element or certain elements that would focus on demographics that were, we thought were underserved in the community, in the anime community, because anime is not a, a uh, genre, it's a category that has genres in it. Mm -hmm. Can you give folks kind of an idea about, you know, 
basically how big the business was, uh, you know, before you became AMC, uh, whether it's in terms of how many titles or revenue. Mm, um, just yeah, I can't really speak about that because I have uh, confidentiality okay. agreements okay. about that. But I mean, it, we were a force to be reckoned with, and you know, mm -hmm. yeah. And I've been in this business thirty years. We were at one time, you know, before I reorganized the business as uh, High Dive and Sentai. Mm -hmm. We were another. We had a different name, and we were the largest in the world for anime. So, and that, for that anime dubbing. yeah, and that you can point to like Forbes and CNN that did articles on us, and we were like 150 million top line revenues back then. So, that's and when was back then? Back then, the nils, whatever you call the last, the, the decade of the zeros, the aughts, okay, not so whatever. <laughs> yeah, whatever you want to call okay, that. Yes, right. yes, okay. yes. Okay. Um, and so, for folks who may not quite understand it, you so you choose a title. Um, Devil's Line, mm -hmm. you buy the rights to that in the U.S.? We usually buy worldwide rights, ex-Asia, okay. and then we work with partners in territories where we don't have a footprint. Mm -hmm. But for territories where we do have a footprint, like English, Spanish, Portuguese, and all the Nordic territories of Europe, uh, we are present and we are streaming our content there and we also work with the uh, you know on the ground home video pump companies in case you there somebody wants to buy a dvd or a premium box set for example that we, we address the fan market there on a consumer level so if i wanted devil's line in spanish or swedish i mean do you do that dub work too we don't do the dub work for sweden the nordic territories all speak english okay. so yeah no worries. Yeah. The Nordic territories all speak English, so they're fine with subtitle and dubbed in English. We all do all the subtitling and dubbing here in-house for English. Um, Spanish is outsourced some, in most cases. We use a dubbing company in different territories for neutral Spanish. And um, any Castilian Spanish is done in, with AMC's office in Spain, or, or, the, or our sub-licensees in Spain. All right, okay. Um, so, okay. I mean, so, this, this is the character. Can, can I ask him like, uh, how, many, like, how many people you employ, or prior to AMC? How, you know, how many jobs this has helped to create? Well, I have, let's see. We, uh, in terms of dubbing, we have been the largest, let's see, how to, uh, we the largest contractual employer of voice talent in the Southwest United States at one point in time. I, I don't know the current okay. post-COVID status, but you know, between us and one of our rivals uh, up north, yeah, we've got to go. Are you talking hundreds of voice actors? Yes. Okay. Yes, hundreds of voice actors. And, and staff is, is there's, between contractors and staff is in the hundreds. Okay. Yeah. And um, so is this a situation where, like, you've got, like, in-house talent, like the old movie studios, like, we're going to put Cary Grant and this, this, this? Yeah. Or do you actually, like, audition? We do auditions. We do cattle calls, they call them. I don't know why they call them that, but I mean, <laughs> they have every reason. But we, 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 we do auditions, and we try to create new and up-and-coming talent as much as possible. Because if you see the same character appearing in the same series over and over and over again, you know, the, tends to not really work well. So we, we have a lot of transfers. People will drive from Austin, they'll drive from Dallas, they'll fly in from LA, they'll come from other cities or states, and they'll actually come here for certain shows. So we're not limited to just Houston talent, although we do, you know, Houston is easy and you know, it's a big city and uh, there's a lot of talent here. Um, you know, we get a lot of people from Austin. You know, the, the UT has a lot of people from Austin that love to come down here because they want to be in radio, TV, film unit. And so they can drive from Austin, do dubbing for us, and head back to Austin. Um, so tell me if, uh, I'm kind of curious, <laughs> I'm gonna guess maybe you were ten nah. years old when you were watching Speed Racer and uh, you know first like, grade, second grade. Okay, thing. Yeah. Okay, so, so you're six or seven years old yeah. when you're watching Speed Racer. Yeah. I watched Speed Racer too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would your six-year-old self be surprised at what you grew up to do? Yeah, my six-year-old self probably didn't know what he wanted to do. I think he wanted to be a police officer or a fireman or maybe a fighter pilot for the military at the time. <laughs> but my 12-year-old uh, self thought he was going to go work for Apple or be a doctor because I actually started the university with, to go be a doctor and a secondary and minor in business. So what do you think your 12-year-old self would say looking at you today? If he, you know. And like, OMG. <laughs> you, you did that? <laughs> no, video games. Because I was a big video game and comic. I mean, when I was a kid, there were no video games. I mean, Space Invaders came out when I was a kid. I mean, before that, it was pinball. You know, that was the big thing. But um, you know, after pinball came, you know, Space Invaders came out and Mario and Donkey Kong and all that stuff. And from there, it just kind of spiraled into you know different things. But the, my tastes always circled around comic books, video games, pinballs, entertainment, and cartoons. And so I've you know really never grown up. I've been doing this, and you know, people say you know. You know 
find what you do and you never work a day in your life and that's kind of where I've gone. You know, this has been a passion project for me from day one. And the team that's assembled, the teams that have come, the teams have gone, the teams that have graduated. It's been a wonderful ride. What do you say to the mothers out there, and I may have been one myself, mm -hmm. that says to their kid, stop with all the video games. Yep. You're never going to get a job playing video games. My father told me when I got an Apple II computer in 1983, uh, it was for the first Apple II computers, with 32K of RAM, didn't even have floppy disk yet. They had tape, cassette tape, like you put in your car. That's how Apple first started before they had the five-inch floppy disk. My grandmother would tell me, and my, my father would tell me, you, that's not going to go anywhere. You're never going to do anything with that. You, that's like not work. That's, not, that's never going to be anything. And then like, flash forward later, you know, you know my dad's calling company. me for IT help, you know, for his <laughs> company. Yeah, he's like, can you come fix this? I'm like, how do I install this? You know, like, yeah, like, yeah I told you computers are going to be a big thing. Yeah. <laughs> I also had a, you know, a good friend. Uh, um, started up. You, you stop? Or, well, no. What I, I guess uh, I wanted to just refocus to ask the question in terms specifically of yeah. video games yes. and uh, anime. Okay. Because I know I've been one. I know there are parents out there who think yeah. this is never going to lead to anything. It leads Do to something uh, serious. Well, there's a balance between video games, screen time, and social media. I think too much screen time without a key focus is maybe too much in today's age because I think it is sucking the life out of our children to some degree. I mean, there should be some limits. Um, video games, I love video games, but I mean, uh, playing for video games for 36 hours and not taking any sleep, probably not healthy. <laughs> uh, you know, so there, there's everything in moderation, including moderation. Yeah. It's my, my philosophy on that. And uh, yes, you can get a job doing it, huh? You can absolutely get a job from video games, definitely. Let's start with this. Tell me what we're looking at at the screen. How, what's going on? How do you do your job? What is this screen about? Okay, so when you are voice acting for an anime, you come into the studio, into the booth, and you get a split screen. One side is going to be the anime itself, and then the other side is going to be the script. Usually your lines will be highlighted, and then you're going to watch the anime, and you're going to look at the time code on the screen, and then you'll come over to the script, and you'll match the time code with the lines, and whenever the time code pops up, you say your line, and um, you're trying to match the mouth flaps on the anime. And who is your character? My character's name is Ruby. We are doing a, a show called Oshinoko, and she play is one of the twins in the show. So I got to ask, it seems like it's tricky to match the words. I mean, even in a, in a cartoon, if you will, where mm -hmm. it's not as precise as live actors. Right. But it seems like it's kind of tricky. Uh, it can be, definitely. Uh, when I first started, it's, it's definitely a learned skill to master how to watch the anime at the same time that you are trying to perform the lines. Um, <laughs> is there a trick? Any little tricks? Uh, the biggest trick is going to match that time code. Because you could have a bunch of lines in a row, and if you go too fast, it's going to throw off the mouth flaps. So you really have to be proficient in looking at the time code and matching it with a cartoon to make sure that you're lining up with how your character is performing. Right. Do you do, are you strictly an anime actress or do you do other stuff? Um, no, I actually started doing anime in 2018. I'm coming on my five-year anniversary, and then I also do theater, and I'm signed with an agency, and I do commercials, film, television, and um, I went to school at the University of Houston and studied BFA in acting. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. um, you support yourself as an actress? I do. I, I do this for half of my time, and the other half, I actually coach gymnastics. All right, okay. Mm -hmm. um, when uh, you are when you are acting mm -hmm. um, in this role <laughs> here, and what are the like? Do people know you by your voice? Do you are you you know traditional actresses may have fans? Do anime voice actors have fans? They do. This is a very large community. Um, it's a it's it's a community that has more recently within the last like. 10, 20 years become extremely popular and is becoming more and more popular. Um, so people definitely keep up with voice actors and they follow like their timeline of, of things that they do. And I've, I mean, I've gotten some messages through my social media. I've had people reach out and, and say they appreciate the work that I've done. So it's definitely very cool to see 
something like this get a reaction versus the other things that I do around town or film, commercial television. The Japanese government offers a program called the JET program where they bring native English speakers to Japan to speak or to teach English to uh, junior high and elementary school students. And so you don't know where you're going to be placed. Uh, I ended up in a very rural place called Hamada City, which is in Shimano, Shimane Prefecture. Uh, and so I lived there for five years and I was kind of thrown into this very small city where I had to kind of speak Japanese every day and learn to read more and write more because I was getting notes from my students and from other teachers and so I spent every day teaching these kids and getting involved in the community and my language skills just kind of developed from there. And you've ended up here. Yes, I got into translation after that. Um, so tell me what's going on there. How does you know, I was joking with you earlier. Right. A lot of people may think, oh, AI does all this, but... Well, yeah. So AI is like anything. It's a tool, so it can have its uses. But Japanese is a very context-heavy language, so there are a lot of sentences where the subject is missing, and it's up to the viewer to kind of interpret where that subject is. And so I think it's hard for AI to get it quite right, so there needs to be a human element. All right, fair enough. So explain to us what you've got on the screen. How does this work? So the way this works is we usually have uh, two separate files. One is the Japanese script that has the characters uh, and all of their dialogue is written out in Japanese. And then we also have the video file, which is all the visuals with a time code in it. So I basically use my headphones. I listen to the dialogue, and I double check it against the script. And then I will write the English translation in this file along with the character name and the time code so that we can send it to the subtitler who then puts the translation on the screen for the audience to read so they know what's being said. Okay. All right. Can you pull up the Japanese one? Yeah, sure. Let's take a look at that real quick. Right. Okay, so uh, what, what's that say? Okay, so this, this is the character, her name is Kurashiki, she's the school nurse. Uh, and in this scene, there's a cat that's coming in, and the cat has just stolen her lettuce from her sandwich. So she says here, Kusoneko, which means like, damn cat, matekora, which means get back here. And then her student, Ganta, who's in the room, says, sensei, rokubyo, which means wait six seconds, because she just got done teaching him that you can overcome anger management if you wait six seconds. <laughs> I need that lesson. Ha, 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 ha.